You're pretty thirsty, aren't you? See, it drives you mad at times. And you have your own favorite delusory ways to give yourself the illusion of water. No wonder you never find it. No wonder you're wandering out in that desert, left, right, north, south. One direction after another, looking for something and you don't know what it is. Oh, just a minute, you, you have ideas of what it is. Shall I name a few? You're thirsty. And you don't, you don't know what water is, not really. And so you look for substitutes for it, thinking that somehow, somehow that marriage, that new career, that philosophy you adopt, that travel, that romance in your own imagination, going to the movies all day long in your own mind, you somehow think that that is going to do it. That is what's driving you crazy because you know it has never succeeded and you know in your heart of hearts that it never will and I guarantee you that you are right on that. See, listen. There is a beautiful, clear stream of pure water running right through the center of that desert that you're tracking around in. It's running right through the center of it. And the last thing you want to do is see it. And I'll explain that in detail a little bit later. But let's, let's follow you around the desert a little bit. And you're in it right now right here this evening as you're seated here. I know that. Don't tell me you have water. Don't tell me you even know what it tastes like. Oh, you're thirsty. But look, this is, this is marvelous news. You've come to the right place tonight. You've come to the right place because you're not going to be lied to. You're not going to be misled. You will never in your life I guarantee you, ever be treated more ruthlessly as you will be tonight. Aren't you grateful? Aren't you delighted that you're not going to be told that the water is off toward the west or toward the east or north or south so that you can pretend to be on the way? You are not on the way. You're going in circles. And if you look down at that desert that you've been wandering around with, I'll tell you what you'll see. You'll see footsteps, footprints, five years old, 10 years old, 20 years old, where you simply retraced your steps, right? You know it and I know it. See, let's start off with something very clear tonight. We, I'm, I'm speaking here, and you're the audience. Let's make an agreement that we're going to be utterly, utterly honest with each other. I'm going to be honest with you. I'll guarantee you that. Now you have to do your part. And you're not going to find it easy because you're not capable of being honest. I'd say you're not capable of being honest. You're so used to deceiving yourself, you think you can just say, well, okay, Mr. Howard, I'll be honest with you tonight. You don't know the depths of your self-deception and we're going to uncover them tonight for your sake. So that you won't be thirsty anymore. Unless, see I'm talking to two groups of people, unless you want to remain thirsty. I'm talking to two groups of people in this room here tonight. Those of you who are so tired who are so worn out, who have no hope left at all, 
who's taken a handful of sand and called it water and tried to drink it and seen the results and know the results absolutely. Now, those of you that I've just described, you can begin to hear. You can begin to be directed toward that beautiful stream cutting right through the middle of that vast Sahara desert. You can be directed toward it. The rest of you, depending on you, may take a little longer or you may never make it at all. The majority of you will go out of this room here tonight not sure what it was all about. And if you still have a, a taste for sand instead of water, you will reject for a while, maybe for a long while, what you've heard. But I'll ask you all, all of you, to do one thing. Take a taste of your own daily life as it unfolded in the last week, in the last month. Just take a good good look at it and see what it was like in reality and see how hard you are. See how thirsty you are. And for those of you in this room tonight, they're, they're ready to say, please, my thirst has reached a burning proportion. Tell me something different and I, I will take it as best I can. And if there is one of you in this room here tonight who say that, I congratulate you. And you and I, those few of you who really want the truth, who want water, you and I are going to have something beautifully in common. We're going to be talking to each other and you, you will sense, am I, is that just that I'm talking to you right now? You will sense that I'm talking to something that is right inside of you. And if we could just begin tonight to awaken just that little bit that says honestly, yes, that is true, I'm thirsty. Or, put it another way, I've run out of excuses, I've run out of alibis, I've run out of arguments. Let's try that one again. If you can honestly say, I've run out of arguments, look and see how you argue about everything. Do you know that when you go out and argue about anything out in that world, anything at all, that is essentially a resistance against truth that can save you from yourself? Argument, anger, fury, is simply filling up a space that you want to keep filled with what you call you, with your old nature, with your conditioned self, with everything that is quite familiar to you. Truth comes along, the river flows through the middle of the desert, and you look at it, and you say, here, it is, here he is, the thirsty man, the thirsty woman, accidentally stumbling upon this beautiful, pure stream in the middle of the desert, and the man or the woman says, what's that? What it is and what you're hearing and going to hear tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is all about the stream, about the pure water that goes through the middle of the desert that you can have if you will do one thing. And listen to this, please. It's called approach. See, human beings, and speaking of the whole human race now, is indeed wandering out in the desert. The truth exists in this world for those who want it not for those who reject it and want to remain egotists and hurt themselves and others the rest of their lives. The truth exists, and there it is, out in the middle of the desert. But you have to do something. It's called approach. So what you can begin to do, starting tonight, with the points that we're going to cover, you can take one short and very timid scary step toward the water. Listen to me, people are afraid of the truth because it's different from them. What are you in love with? Shall I tell you? Well, it'll take all night. You're falsely in love with your name. You're falsely in love with everything that makes you what you are. You're falsely in love with your prides and with your conceits and with your vanities and with your angers. And if you get up and walk out of this talk, you have proved it. And if you disappear during the break, you have proved it. This talk is for those who have begun to grow up a little bit, 
who are not utterly childish, who are not completely immature, for those who, for those who no longer want to wreck themselves and everyone they contact. And if you are wrecking yourselves, you're wrecking everyone you meet. You have no conscience and no decency at all. I'm talking to those who want to grow up. Now here's the situation. Here's humanity, here's you, wandering around, and there's the truth. Now, you take the stream as being your enemy because all your life you have taken sand as being your friend. In spite of the incredible fact that sand can't cure thirst, you take that as your friend because you don't know what truth is, therefore you take it as the enemy because it's different and unlike what you have now known. The only thing you know, the only thing that you have is from your past. Everything that you have identified with, everything that you have collected, everything that you call precious, including, listen to this, including your fears. I'm telling you that if you could grasp what we're getting at tonight. You could walk out of that door and never be afraid again of anything. I said you could. Now, if you don't do that, what is the reason for it? It's because you value your fears, and that's a part of your conditioning. Well, we better look into this very peculiar situation in which human beings find value in being terrified. Now, why would anyone why would anyone in their right mind, and you're not in your right mind if you choose it, why would anyone value being scared of life? Oh yes, I had better add that too. Being afraid of death. Why would anyone be afraid of life and of death? I'll tell you why. Because that's all you've got. How poverty-stricken to only have a name. What an utterly constricted life in which all you have is your own thoughts swirling around inside your mind all day long, driving you crazy, only having that. And you would vow on a million dollars you would vow that that is the only kind of existence possible for you and you want to believe that lie. Because you're afraid of death. You're afraid of the death of this false self, of this accumulated self. You're the, you, can you believe what I'm going to say next? You fear the loss of your terror. All right, all right. Come on, we'll we'll investigate this. Being reasonable about, about it, what percentage of your life are you aware of that is negative? You know, you know what's negative? Uh, jealousy, hatred, anger, self-righteousness, pretending that you understand, lying. What percentage? Could you pull a reasonable figure out of there to yourself? Now, these are just the ones you can think of in the few seconds I gave you there. And I want you to know that your entire life is composed of that. You get, see what we're getting at? If all, if all a person has is defeat, if all a person has is hiding in a corner, huddling like that. If that is all he has, then that is what constitutes his life. This is the only life you have. Look, if you have an unhappy life, then that's the life you have. You have an unhappy life. You don't have both an unhappy life and an unhappy life. You, have, you don't have two lives. A person says, well, I'm happy one day and miserable and the next. You're even unhappy when you're happy because you've simply covered it up with a delusion of some kind and you've got an emotional shot, an emotional thrill of some kind, and you call that happiness, which is simply a distraction from your unhappiness. So you're never really happy. You've simply got a thrill, thrillism. You've got a false feeling of life as we've called it, a false feeling of life of being anything negative, anything wrong, anything that supplies a vibration inside of you. All right, back to the original point. This is very important to you to understand why you fear both life and death. And as you cease to fear one, you cease to fear the other. 
since the only thing you have is sand, dryness, you're going to hang on to that for all you're worth. Because you think, follow this illogic of the illogical intellect. If someone takes away your false life, your wrong life, then you say, I will die. Go real slow on this. I'm giving you in just a few seconds the secret of the ages. You could read a 10,000 books and not understand in very concise form what you're going to get now and what you are getting. You have identified with certain collections of thoughts, feelings, and experiences. How great you were in high school and how nice the marriage is. And you're, so res you're a nice, respectable, middle-aged man or woman and all is well with you. Except that you have so many secret hatreds in you that you don't want to see them. You would collapse from shock if you ever saw them. And so you're living an unconscious life. Now, you're afraid that truth, God, reality, will take that life away from you. And then you'll say, if they take my old life of concealed violence, of wandering around, then who will I be? Now, I want you to know that that is one of the most insidious lies the dark forces uh, in the intellect ever played on any human being. And I'll tell you what you're going to have to do. Very few human beings ever do it. Very few ever make it. Do you want to make it? You're going to have to do it. And here's what I'm talking about. You're going to have to voluntarily give up being you. You're going to have to simply see no value whatever in being what you have been. Now, it's essential that you be very, very honest and see what you have been. No lying here tonight. All your deception has to go. You're afraid, then, that if your old life is taken away, that you will cease to exist. No, that is a lie. You will not cease to exist. You will be born again authentically and not as the religious hypocritical Christians say so much in the newspaper and in their so-called testimonies, which is another very evil, evil thing. You will be authentically born again. You will know what it means to have a new life, a true life. You will know, you will know what it means to have everlasting life, ladies and gentlemen. Now, you don't have life now. You, you do not have life now. You have existence. What you have is an existence in time, which the intellect creates. The intellect creates time, past, future. You have a time life. And upon the ending of the physical life, then all you have is nothing, not you. You do not carry time into eternity, if you can follow these very, very profound thoughts. You cannot carry your memory into eternity because memory, thoughts, come and go. And have you ever noticed, there's a sharp clue for you, have you ever noticed how often your identity changes who you are? You're a marvelously respected, uh, respectable citizen, a politician or an industrialist or a preacher or whatever, highly respectable, and then you do something and you get disgraced and you're defrocked or you're kicked out of the industry or whatever, and you're voted out of office. One day, you were one person, highly respectable, and had it made, and the next day, because something went wrong, you're disgraced. Now, which one of these two people were you? The fact is, you were neither one. You have no identity at all that the intellect can create, but you think you do, and then having created yourself, a thousand different identities and recreating them every day, you now are terrified of the death of that, the death of an illusion. If you would let truth, reality, put an end to your illusions, it would not put an end to you. It would put an end to your delusions. It would put an end to all your pains and all your sufferings because all your agony and all your wandering around is based on a false sense of self. Notice how touchy you are. 
Notice how you have your defenses ready, even in this room. Watch your defenses, even as I'm talking to you, and I know you have them. Which is why most of you people, most of you people in this room, listen to me, I know you thoroughly, 100%. Most of you, of the new people, will go and never come again. Right now, you have the most marvelous opportunity of your life, up until you leave this room, the most marvelous opportunity to find the secret of the ages, which is truth itself, to be united with God. Do you want to use that? That's all right. Because while you're in this room, temporarily, there is a suspension. Your hostility toward truth, which is enormous, by the way, your hostility toward truth is temporarily suspended, held down, because this room right at this moment and until we all leave right at this moment this is an extremely healthy sane atmosphere this is a beautiful atmosphere in this room now because it is not controlled by you because it's controlled by something far above you by truth itself don't miss what opportunity you have then here tonight to understand all these facts that we're talking about now I've given you some groundwork Everything you fear to let go of yourself, for example, is the very thing you should do. And you see, I, I have to explain so many things to you. God exists. See, I have to explain that to you because you don't know that. You, you don't know that at all. All you know is the word God, and you, you blithely toss the word around as if you understand it, and you don't. God exists, but he doesn't exist the way you think he does. You always construct God according to your desires and your fears, and so you can pray to someone, someone that's going to help you. God will help you only when you start using the raw materials he gave you and begin to develop that. You have a mind, but it's misguided and all mixed up, and you have emotions, and you would rather thrill than understand. I'm going to tell you now the precise moment when you can change if your heart is right. And when I tell it to you, those few of you who accept the truth and go all the way with it over years and years and years, you will recognize what I'm talking about. The rest of you who want to go back to your baseball games on Sunday, not that they're wrong in themselves, but want to go back to want to go back to your own understanding of life, you will not, of course, understand this. I want you all to hope for the day, to pray for the day, to phrase it like that. When you say something like this, and you don't have to know who you're saying it to, you just have to say it. Here it is. And you're, you're emotional. And you say, this is the last time I'm going to be deceived. You may state it in another way, but essentially that is the exact phrase. This is the last time I am going to be conned. I, I, you don't, I said you don't know who you're talking to. But there's a feeling in you, there's a surging in you, it comes up spontaneously. You have had it. Oh, you're emotional. This is beautiful. It's a turning point. I'd better tell you now, before we go any further, what you're rebelling against. You're rebelling against your own lying nature and nothing else. Look at the idiots, those idiots out there who rebel against that law being passed against the government, against some organization or the other idiots who join another organization to put pressure on another organization. These people are mad. You shouldn't have anything to do with them. Now look, if you want to rebel, why don't you rebel on your own side? The feeling will be very powerful and you will recognize it as being right. For the third time, it's not necessary to know who you're saying this to because it's, it's an expression of something that is beginning to come alive in you. And there's various phrasings of it, but I'll guarantee it will come out something like, this is the last time I'm going to be deceived. 
the last time I'm going to be fooled. I don't want to be pained anymore. It is not worth it. I thought it was. I used to love to get furious and angry and hate people. And all, and all it did was shake me. I am no longer again going to justify my hatred, justify my anger, just justify my foolishness. I have seen through what a pure, pure idiot I have been. I want you to know that when you say this, there will be very, very little at this point of self-condemnation. If you condemn yourself, you've simply kept the thing going again. Now you've got an identity of being a guilty sinner. Now you've got an identity and you're going to go from what you call being a sinner to a saint. And so you go to a church or read a book and you call yourself changed and different. You haven't changed a thing except the label. If there's a box with junk inside of it and the label, the, the sign on the cover says gold. It says gold and it's still junk inside. And you haven't changed a thing and you know it because you have to live with yourself and you have to think through yourself and you have to suffer from yourself. Back to the turning point, back to the experience. You've achieved something that is truly miraculous in this life, which is standing aside and instead of being your state, you're beginning to observe it. You begin to see it pass through you. You're beginning to separate yourself from what you used to be, how you used to be, and you're beginning to understand. And you'll clap your hand to your forehead and you'll say, there really, there really is something else in this universe besides me. Thank heaven. Can you think of one thing more miserable than you being you know you can't and you never will. If you can go through this process of permitting reality to utterly humiliate you, you will become a truly decent and innocent human being. And you will no longer, listen please, some of you here had better listen very carefully to this, and you will no longer make hell your God. Well, just for a minute, take your attention off yourself and think of some friends. Think of some relatives you know. Did you hear that phrase, who make hell their God? Do you know people who are always mad? Do you know people who are always accusing someone else? Always slandering, always sneering, always snarling? Do you know people? Sure you do, of course you do. And some of them are very cunning about it, aren't they? And very, very devilish about it. These ladies and gentlemen are lovers of hell. Nothing can be done for them, but there's something you can do and it's called total avoidance. Because you, if you are an authentic spiritual student, you have nothing in common with them, and you would better not see them physically. And the easiest way to get rid of lost people is to begin to find yourself. And they won't want your company, and you want, won't want theirs. It's very mutual that way. Oh, you think you're going to be so lonely without all your old thoughts that you used to have. You, you, know, you know how you can't stop thinking? You know how your mind drives you mad all the time? That is one portion of you being in love with hell. It drives you crazy and you love it. If you didn't love it, you wouldn't, you wouldn't continue with it. As I explained very carefully early, and I'll go over it briefly, you're afraid of the loss of yourself. There is no way in this universe that a truly, a true, authentic spiritual experience 
can be explained from one human being to another. But there's something you can do. You work according to what we've been talking about tonight. You cease to love your misery and your sneering, and God help you if you ever sneer at what you've heard here tonight. God have mercy on you if you sneer at what you've heard here tonight. You're going to need it. What you can do is work so hard on yourself that you will review what you've heard here tonight and the testimony of the truth of what you heard will be in you and from you. Don't take anybody's word for anything. You've been doing that with those phony religions you followed so long with your own personal philosophy of getting rich and getting sex. That was your philosophy for so long. And look how desperate you are. You want to prove whether the truth is, not whether I'm right or not. This is not my viewpoint. This is what I'm talking to you. I'm not talking about my opinion. I don't have any opinions about truth at all. I have no viewpoints about truth, whatever. If you want to, if you want to prove absolutely whether I'm talking the truth or not, then you find it for yourself. And then on the next time I see you out in that audience, I'll see a different manner in you. I'll see a different expression on your face because I can look at you right now and read you as I pass very fastly. I, I can see you. I understand what's going on beside those eyes. I can see the tilt of your head or whether your head is down like that. One man sat at the talk the other night. His head was down like that all during the first half. And sure enough, he disappeared during the break. Two things are known about you. Two things. The first is the fact that you are lost out in the desert. Every single one of you in this room, there's no exceptions to it at all. Every one of you is lost. The second thing that is known is that if you admit that you're lost and walk as frightened as you are toward the water, as strange as it seems to you, if you walk toward the water, you will never thirst again. That's a promise. Not only is that a promise, but you can prove it for yourself right in your own life. And now you're a good human being and very, very human beings, very few other human beings and no relatives will ever want what you have and they won't even know about it because there's no way they can recognize it but one thing you have it and you'll have it forever good evening, good evening. <clears throat> it's hard to grasp mr. Howard's ideas with an ordinary mind. It's impossible, in fact, to grasp these higher ideas with an ordinary mind. You and I have gathered, have had given to us, have had forced on us ideas and knowledge. We then believed being able to remember these ideas, being able to recall this knowledge, that it's understanding and that the more of that I get, the more that you get, the more intelligent we are. Therefore, if I can recite to you from memory, whatever it is, I'm intelligent. That's not what Mr. Howard's talking about. He's talking about, first of all, being able to see the fact, the absolute fact, that my mind, the way it operates, your mind, the way it operates, is not intelligent at all. And to study that, to study the operation of your mind, to see if it is, in fact, intelligent, and then discover that it's not, then, by studying Mr. Howard's higher ideas and starting to feel them go beyond them we must have new ideas we must have fresh ideas we must have 
sunny ideas, higher ideas. We must have that to work with. And we must get that from someone who has already been through what you and I must go through. As he was describing earlier in the talk tonight, he was saying that there is a time that we must say a certain thing, and that is enough is enough. He tells us exactly the way we are. He tells us then what we must do about it. And then he tells us exactly what will happen step by step, which, of course, is the proof that the man's telling us the truth. If, now what a big if this is, if we're not a bunch of hypocrites and if we're not just a bunch of liars, if we really want to be different and if we're willing to take that first little step to discover for ourselves if there really is something higher. And he said, don't believe anyone. He said, find out. But I'll tell you what I've learned. I've learned from holding classes here in Boulder City. I've learned that people don't want what they say they want. And that's what he was talking about earlier. Most people don't want to be any different. As Mr. Howard said the other night, he said, if you offer people a pink pill and say this will solve all your problems, nobody will take it. You've been given the pink pill here tonight. You've been told absolutely everything that you need to know to be an absolutely healthy, sane, whole, free human being. Now it's up to you. Now what you're going to have to do is to take those Take that that you've been given, and you're going to have to put it in, to work in your life, and you must not fall for the trick that the wrong parts of you are going to try to play on you and say, I don't know how. You must do it anyway. If we knew how, we'd already done it. I don't know about you, but I don't know how, but I'm going to do it anyway. Which means I'm going to see through the hoax of Murray. Now, I want to change the subject just a little bit. How many of you enjoyed tonight's lecture so far? Let's see your hands. Good. How many of you have come to more than one? Okay. Tonight is the last of this current series. How many of you would like for Mr. Howard to come back? How many want more? Okay, I'm going to see if I can't twist his arm a little bit and see if we can't get him back maybe this fall. What do you think? <laughs> Mr. Howard. If you had a serious physical ailment and a doctor said to you, now here's some medicine, it will cure you. You have to take a bottle a day endlessly. For a long, long time. Here it is, a bottle of medicine today. Just take it, you'll become well again. Ah, oh, you're so pleased to hear that there's a way out of your illness. So you take the bottle, you take the top off, and you take the first sip of it, and ah, oh, it tastes terrible. Ahead of me? <laughs> oh, and now you're torn, aren't you? so filled with doubts and confusion and contradiction. You want so badly to get well, and yet you hate the bitter medicine. Do I have to go through this? Doctor says, this is the medicine. So you take another one, a little sip, and it's terrible. You manage to get through the first day, just barely manage to get through it. And you keep pleading with the doctor, couldn't, couldn't you give me something else, some other kind of medicine? This is the only medicine that's going to cure you. And, you. and you fight and argue with him. But the doctor has heard this a thousand times before. And he is an honest doctor. He's a true doctor. He, he wants you to get well. So he says, sir or madam, this is the medicine. The medicine is bitter, but it heals. So you try it the second day tastes awful again. You know you have to, you know you have to do it. There's no point fooling around. Just take the medicine. Just do it. 
a week passes, two weeks. On the 15th day, on the 15th bottle, you begin to notice something very strange, but you don't know what it is. Your mind is saying something, your spirit is saying something, but you don't know what it is. You just say, what's this? So you keep taking the medicine day after day. At the end of at the end of a month, you say, there's sure something different about this 30th bottle than the first one. And you, the 31st day, you take it up, you take it, I've got it. This how astonishing. And you, you run back to the doctor, you say, is this the very same medicine you gave me 30 years? Very same medicine. Are you sure it's the very, very same medicine? And you say, well, doctor, what's, what's going on here? This medicine is beginning to taste sweet. Do I have to say any more? Okay. How many of you here were here for the earlier meeting this afternoon? <laughs> You'll see why they laugh in a minute. How many of you were assigned an exercise this afternoon? How many of you flopped completely this afternoon? <laughs> I've been giving the same exercise for nine days, and if I do come back in the fall, I'm going to start all over again until you get it right. <laughs> the exercise is a very simple one, but you won't be able to do it. You have to start, and you have to try, and you have to see that you fail to do it. Your awareness of your failure begins to show you many things about yourself. One of them being that your mind is a vagabond. that is always wandering somewhere else instead of you keeping it where it should be. You're not aware of yourself at the moment. You're not aware of your body. You don't keep your mind where your body is and your body where your mind is. They're separate, and they're in division and contradiction. Here's the exercise for all of you, please. And when you, when you get home or tomorrow you suddenly remember you failed, remember that your remembering that you failed has shown something to you. When you go out of this door tonight, all of you, as you pass through the door, I simply want you to know that you're passing through the door. You're not to be thinking about anything else, and you're not to be thinking about passing through the door either. This is an exercise in being aware of yourself, and it's the simplest kind of exercise because it involves only your physical body. Later on, you can become aware of your thoughts and of your feelings and your angers and so on. But starting with the simplest of all, when you go out the door, simply know that you're passing through it. When you get out to your car and get into the car, as you slide into the car, Again, know that you're sliding into the car. This has four parts to it. This has four parts to it. Third part is, when you go into the next building after leaving here, whether you're a home or a cafe or whatever, when you go into the building, go from outside to inside, you're to know that you're passing through the doorway of your home. Simply be aware of your physical body going through there. Don't be thinking about that snack in the refrigerator, but be aware of yourself going through it. And last of all, the next time you pick up either food or drink, your hand reaches for the apple or the spoon for the tea or whatever, simply be aware that you are starting to take some food or drink. Know it. You notice how you eat unconsciously, you don't know it. You look down, there's a big dinner, and all of a sudden you look down, it's all gone. <laughs> you say, Who swiped my dinner? <laughs> you didn't even know you'd eaten it, did you? Be conscious of yourself going out of here, going into the next building of um, the whatever the four were. And we'll go on to the questions now. You want to raise your hand and keep them short and to the point, please. Try. <clears throat> is helplessness a cover-up for an insidious power play for manipulation? Helpless, helplessness is a self. Helplessness is an I. Helplessness is an identity which you love. And you can go on from being helpless to all sorts of other things. For example, being enraged at life in general for making you such a helpless puppet in the face of this all-powerful world. Helplessness is a very subtle form of self-worship in which you are you. 
helpless me. Now you can boil and rage at the world and hate them and get even further false identifications out of that one little marvelous parent feeling of feeling helpless. When you find yourself, you won't be helpless at all. Not only that, but you won't be there at all. You, you can never be strong. Uh, how many, raise your hand if you get it. Uh, we'll start all over. You, you can never be strong because there's no you there to be strong. If there's a you there, it's helpless and weak. And you're thinking about it, aren't you? When you are strong, you never think about it. You don't have to. Real spiritual strength is not intellectual, it's spiritual. It comes down to you and it inhabits your physical self, but it is not you. You have to, you've given up you, remember? No, you don't want to remember. You have to give up you in order to be strong. You can never be strong. I can never be strong, but there is strength. This is not religion I'm talking about. I'm not giving you metaphysical words. I'm giving you a fact. Is there one person in this room who senses the fact? Is there one of you? Uh, questions, please. The lady back there. When I feel anger or fear, and I'm able to observe it, <clears throat> what, am, what do I do with the staff? Because if I, I'm not able to let it go at this point, usually. No, no, no. You don't do anything with it. You simply let it pass away, which it will do naturally, because it's the nature of thoughts to come and go. You see anger in you, for example. Now you really have to see it and be honest about it. You know, I, I really was in fury over that thing that happened. All right, you see it, and then if you don't identify with it, it will fade away from itself. And if you do that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, each time it will go weaker and weaker and weaker and recur less and less often until finally it will go away altogether. But if you identify with it, if you say, there's anger there, oh, there I went again, I'm a hateful, angry person. See, you've recreated yourself. You've now said, ah, oh, I'm, so, I'm so sorry that I'm angry. You, some of you people go around apologizing for your bad behavior all the time. Your very apology is another I. I'm sorry, dear wife, I made you cry, but look how sorry I am. He's going to do it again tomorrow. Somebody told me it was important for me to laugh at myself. What do you think of that? Somebody told him that it was important to be able to laugh at himself. What do you think of that? There comes a time in your inner development when you see how idiotic you have been all your life. And that releases a certain humor in you, a certain... Well, let me phrase it another way. Do you know people who are so deadly serious, you know? I, I watch people in the audience while I'm talking, and I look around and I see someone, I, I don't care, you can hand them a, a joke book, and they couldn't <laughs> smile. You know why? Because they're sitting, I see them, I, I know, they're not even here, they're gone somewhere. They're looking down like that, and everybody else is laughing, and they're sitting down like that, they're, they're facing her. This is complete self-absorption. Beginning, or as a general principle, beginning to laugh at yourself, is very, very healthy. But then you have to understand, really, that there's nothing to laugh at there, finally. <laughs> Jim. Uh, what philosophies or disciplines have you found helpful in your development? And could you recommend uh, some to uh, a person just starting out? Oh, yes. They're all at the book table back there. <laughs> and I want... I, I heard that you've studied other various uh, disciplines. No, I don't want to go into that. I do want to recommend a, a very special book for you, though. Uh, but let me ask you a question first. Are you afraid of living with yourself? Uh, please, everyone nod your head. Then we get it over with. <laughs> nod your head. You are afraid of living with yourself. You're afraid of your own thoughts. You're afraid of what you might do that's wrong, that's stupid. Aren't you afraid of doing something stupid? You do it all the time. How many of you blurt out stupid things? Blurt, how many of you see the blurters? There's a reason for it. And the reason for it is that you do not understand the 
insidious, and I chose that word well, the insidious dark forces that inhabit human beings and inhabit you, me, and the rest of us until we get rid of them through the application of truthful principles. I highly recommend that every one of you go out to the book table after the meeting and buy the little green book. It's only a dollar. And it's worth a million dollars in information for you. The little green booklet called Freedom from Harmful Voices. It will answer a thousand questions that we don't have time to go into here about why do you think what you think? Why do you obey compulsions to do certain things? Why, and a very important one, why you have a tormented mind. You get to know the enemy, and you'll get the enemy out of your life and out of your mind. Get to know the enemy. Recognition is everything, as it says in that book itself. Get the little green booklet. It's only a dollar, as I said, called Freedom from Harmful Voices. Read it over and over and over again, and you will recognize what's been happening to you ever since you were a little child. You will see it right there in front of you. It's all put very concise, single sentences. It couldn't be put clearer. We'll take a couple more, then go home. We do have to clear out by a certain time. Uh, this lady here. Would you explain the meaning of life for a wise mankind put on this earth? The what kind of life? The meaning of life. Oh, the meaning of life is to wake up. Are you following the meaning of life? Do you know what it means to wake up? Don't one of you raise your hand. I'll explain to you what it means to be asleep, and then you can recognize that. To be asleep means that in the secret of your heart, you tell a lie. And that lie is, I already know what is best for me. You don't know. If you knew what was best for you, you wouldn't suffer like you do. You wouldn't be afraid as you are. You wouldn't be as jealous as you are. You men wouldn't be so competitive. You wouldn't be competitive as all, as a matter of fact, in your finances. You wouldn't... You wouldn't be envious of that man who graduated from high school with you who's now the president of the corporation and you're just the janitor. <laughs> what difference does it make what you are? God does not know the difference between the president and the janitor. I guarantee you that. People know it. Look, go, go out and make enough money to pay the rent and get some food on the table and forget the rest of it. Don't you, don't you be in this world anymore. Don't you be a part of this sickness anymore. You be the one person out of, out of 10,000 in your neighborhood that is learning how to become sane. This is the class in sanity. And sanity and happiness and freedom are exactly the same thing. I saw a hand, another hand, the lady, the lady there. Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Pardon? What is depression? What is depression? Self-centeredness. You don't, you don't know what to do with yourself, and you always must, the self must always have an activity. And depression is as good as elation. E depression is just as elating as elation, because it gives you something to do with yourself, and you fear to be without some kind of an internal activity. And isn't it marvelous? Look at all the eyes involved in depression. I feel bad, I feel gloomy, everything is hopeless, on and on and on. You close your eyes when you do it, that's what I did. You're all, look, see, you're all self-enclosed. You can't see anything out there at all, and you're going to have accidents. The gentleman. When, there, when there's no longer a you, what uh, takes over? I mean, when you say you, is that equivalent to an ego or... Uh... <coughs> when there's no longer a you, what takes over? Wait, what's left? What's left? Would you like to find out? <laughs> Good night. <laughs> it is an overwhelmingly tragic fact. A fact that you have been battered around for years. You've been accused and threatened and insulted, generally kicked around. 
Did it ever occur to you why that happened? Did you ever get so curious as to why you met so many vicious, cruel, unkind people on your way to growing up? The answer is no. Because you weren't able to understand the situation clearly. All you knew is that, listen to this, huh? All you knew is that it hurt pretty bad. You know, those school experiences in grammar school and high school, those humiliating situations you had. And that wasn't enough. Then you went home and you got it there too. And then you went somewhere else to visit someone. You got it there. What I'm getting at is as follows. We have so badly been bruised and hurt that we formed a very unfortunate single reaction to it, which is to put up a shield. Now, you may not be conscious that you're doing this, but I am telling you that it's there. And I am telling you that it's very thick and very handy, and you don't understand the nature of the shield, but it's there. So that when anything seems to come along to threaten you, to hurt you, up goes the shield. Inwardly you have it ready at a second notice, but because you don't understand your inner reactions at all, I'm telling you, you don't. Up it comes, and when you put up that defensive shield, you have lost all opportunity to understand the situation and put an end to it once and for all. How would your life be different if you, if you could never ever get hurt again by anyone, by any condition. No news event could frighten you as it now does. Think a little bit. Go ahead. How would your day be different? How would your whole, the rest of your life be different if you could never ever be hurt again by anything? It is possible. So for a while we're here, please. As best you can do it and understand, <coughs> as best you can, come on, set the shield aside. You don't need it here in this room. You don't need it anywhere. But I'm saying you bring the habit of it in here. And we're going to go into some very powerful things, fascinating things, curing things. But I want to make you aware at the very start of how our old nature, all these accumulated fears and timidities, defenses that we have, how they creep up on you and you don't know that they are preventing you from hearing the marvelous news about a totally new life. So watch yourself, even as while I'm talking to you. Watch yourself and see how there may be <coughs> some disagreement inside of you maybe even hostile, or that very subtle and treacherous reaction called a spirit of dullness and confusion. Do you know that confusion is a defense against hearing something your old nature doesn't want to hear? You should suddenly say, well, I don't understand that. You don't want to understand it. That's why you're confused. You fear to understand it, and this is what I'm getting at. You fear that, again, look, let me tell you something. I am not your father, and I'm not your mother. I'm not that school teacher. I'm not that friend, that boyfriend, that girlfriend, that society, that organization, that event. You, you live in a world that's a lunatic land, I'll tell you. But for now, you're in sane land right here in this room. <laughs> You can give yourself a chance to hear and to understand this afternoon if you'll just relax. Don't be who you've always been. You don't have to be. 
And I've given you a few clues by which you can start to listen in a new way. To get your miserable, wretched, treacherous old nature out of the way and hear something that's fresh. And you stop being in love with your misery. If you continue it, you will experience it and you've made your choice for the rest of your life. You are indeed being betrayed. And I'm going to go into that a little later. You're being betrayed, but you don't know who's doing it. You always put it outside of you. You put it the past experiences, or you're not educated enough, or not good looking enough, or whatever. You're the only betrayer you have ever had, and that is a fact. Don't you let that old nature put one over on you for the time that we're here. That would be a marvelous new experience for you to even begin to see. How you hear a certain thing and you say, that's not right. How do you know it's not right? The very reason that you, the, the very resistance and hostility to what you're hearing is absolute evidence that your old nature knows that it's right and it doesn't want to let hold its hold on you, let go of its hold on you. So, with that introduction, how many of you are frustrated? How many frustrated? Well, only half of you raised your hand. I assume the rest of you are bubble with happiness. <laughs> you don't look very bubbly to me. <laughs> Frustration is a, a terribly poor device to carry around with you. And let me tell you what it does. It, uh, frustration simply serves delusion. You use it in order to keep yourself, as I said a minute ago, to keep yourself in confusion because if you started to become clear, you would have to give something up that you don't want to give up. How many of you live in daydreams half your life? Nightmares the other half. <laughs> Pretty miserable. We're here, we're here to start the cure. If you, and if you accept the start, the, the cosmic medicine, the medicine of truth, how different you can begin to be walking out that door when you go out of here. I want to tell you one of, I might call it one of my favorite stories that backs up what we're going to describe, what we're going to talk about. Namely that frustration is merely the lack of harmony of all our inner parts. You understand you have a mind, you have feelings, you have a body, and you have sex desires, and you have a wish to relax, on and on and on. Frustration is simply the result of you not being whole, complete inside of not being one person with all your inner parts working the same way, in agreement. There's opposites. There's a tug of war inside. Haven't you felt it? Haven't you felt contradiction inside of yourself? One minute you want to say yes, the minute you want to say no. The third minute you, you don't know what to think, maybe. Then you start the whole process over again. It's, it's terrible to not know what you are all about. Will you agree to that? Here's a little story, and you'll see what we're getting at. Here's a man who was being chased down the streets of London, being chased by some criminals. And he ran down the streets and down the alleys and in back of buildings and back of stores. And they kept after him and getting pretty close. This is our hero who's running from the criminals. So he runs down one particular alley and he looks back and there they are in hot pursuit, four or five of them, they've got guns. So he looks around and it turns out to be a dead end alley. He seems trapped. But then he sees a little walkway going up to a door at the back of the building. Since this is an alley, the door is at the back. So he goes up the steps, opens the door and goes in. And it's a little bit dark in there, but he sees a light somewhere off there in the distance. Then he sees some more steps ahead of him and he looks back and they're starting to come after him coming in the back door. So he goes up the steps and he walks a few feet along on what apparently is a platform. And all of a sudden he finds himself facing an audience just like this, about a hundred people of an audience. And they start applauding him. He thinks about it, what, what on earth is going on? He finally figures it out. They were expecting a speaker who never arrived and they thought he was it. 
So there he is, out in the middle of the platform, audience applauding him, smiling and beaming, and he doesn't know what he's supposed to do. But they give him clues. They start asking him questions. <laughs> and he answers them. And he, and he does everything that you do. He generalizes. He pauses and says, that's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> then he doesn't give the answer. Goes on and on for a while. And he manages to bluff it out pretty well. He's, he thinks on his feet. And he manages finally to escape from the criminals who are chasing him. That's us. We're put in a position where we, we feel pressurized by life, by people. And we find ourselves in a position where we have to start giving speeches. Don't you wish you didn't have to explain so much? Answer those questions from people out there who demand to know why. Let me tell you, the, the neurosis of society, it is backed up by putting pressure on you, by asking you questions about your personal life, about your finances. See, you don't, you don't even know how much you resent the enormous pressure that authorities, friends, relatives, put on you. You don't even know how much resentment you have because you've lived with it so long you have accepted it as necessary. People ask you personal questions and you answer them. You don't even know you're burning. You asked for it by being in the very internal position that you are in. You know, if you were really a free human being, no one would listen. You, you can get rightly excited at this. No one would dare ask insolent questions of you. I'll, I'll give you a little project right now, starting effective now. You write down every time someone asks you a question that you resent answering. You watch how they impose themselves on your life. And then, and then you remember what I'm going to say next. Your level of being, your very low level of being, is what caused them to do it. You watch and see how you change, how you get stronger, how people begin to automatically behave different toward you because they know better than the fool around with you. And I'll tell you, there's a very profound spiritual truth there. If you really, and not phony, not being a phony or religious hypocrite, if you really start living with the light inside of you, and it's really there, the light of truth, of reality, the reason other people won't come around and bother you and try to take you and con you as they've done in the past, darkness doesn't like light. It's afraid of it. And they will know by your very manner by the way you talk, by the way you look, that they had better leave you alone. Now, you have no hostility in you toward them at all. You used to have hostility and darkness being the same thing. They will leave you alone because they know they can't get what they want from you. And one thing they want is simply to win an ego victory over you. And uh, would you agree, and you'd better internally, that lots of your energy and lots of your actions tend toward winning ego victories over other people. Of course they are. That's the only food you have, unfortunately. And you don't even know you're doing it. Your level consists of everything you eat, mixture of your understandings and of your misunderstandings. As you begin to understand more, your light, the light and the level rises higher and higher and higher. It, oh, what a relief that you don't have to figure out how to handle that person anymore. See, now you have to figure it out, don't you? You know that boyfriend, ladies, that husband, that wife, that girlfriend? You, you, you may not be aware of how much you calculate how to behave in just the right way to keep peace in the family. You poor, pathetic human beings try, trying to keep peace instead of making conscious war inside yourself. 
You know, do you understand that? Do you understand it? All right, I'll explain it. You're frustrated because you're divided inwardly. You're divided inwardly because you think you have to have certain things from other human beings. You think you must have them in order to feel secure. You need that man. You need that position, that promotion. You need that prestige or that reputation. You think that you need to have them. Now, knowing, knowing that and knowing it wrongly inside of you, your little calculating mind figures out just what you must do in order to sell the other person on you. In order to, in other words, to put it in a phrase you'll understand, you try to buy your friendships. Don't, aren't you involved with a lot of people you don't even like? I'm not talking about work where it's necessary and a physical thing. How many friends would you like to get rid of? There are some, aren't there? You, you can do it. You know what to do. Just know, just know that you don't need their sickness anymore. <laughs> what do you call it when all your friends can talk about is their very unadmirable activities, what they want, and they talk about themselves all the time. And the only reason you associate with them is because you want your turn in talking to them. If you were to grow up, <laughs> If you were to mature, you could stay home and live your own life. You could, you could be very happy with your own company. You can't do that now, can you? You get a little nervous when you start facing what's going on inside of you at home alone. And so you go out some stupid place and waste all that money. You get, when you get sane, you'll save 50% of your income. I'm t <laughs> at a minimum. All the things you buy and all the, all the gifts, the stupid gifts you buy for other people so that they'll like you. They don't like you anyway. <laughs> I said we live in a world that you can very aptly describe as lunatic land. And I started off by saying that we've been hurt very badly, no doubt about that. But we come to think that there's some kind of a, a law that says we have to remain as we are, that you have to please foolish people, that you have to be afraid of them. Anytime you want, you can, you can move out of lunatic land and thereby free yourself from all its insane laws. Anytime you want. Now, I'll give you an example of one of those insane laws. You remember when you were a boy, a girl, how bad it hurt to be laughed at? Huh? Oh, do you remember how it hurts as adults to be laughed at? To be ridiculed, to be scorned? The reason you still have that pain is because you live under the law of spiritual infancy or no spirituality at all. The reason you ever get hurt being laughed at or being left out in any way at all, the only reason is, is because you think you possess a self that can be hurt. And there's no such thing. You've created it out of your own delusions, out of your own desires to be someone, to be something. And the very getting hurt is part of the trick that you've played on yourself and continue to be played on you. I give you an order starting right now. I'm looking at the clock, which is 10 minutes after 3, 5 minutes after 3. I'm going to give you an order at this time. You will never, ever again permit anyone or anything to hurt your feelings. Now, the reason I give you that, tell you that, is because I know that it's unnecessary. I know that you need never again cry over anything. I know that it's never again necessary for you to be depressed. Let's see the hands of the people who are depressed today. Gloomy heavy-spirited. Heavy-spirited, that's pretty good. That describes it, doesn't it? 
All right, now I've given you, you came to this talk, to this class, to get instructions, did you not? Spiritual instructions, right? All right. Now, uh, do you know more than me? How many know more than me? Let's see the hands. Everyone knows more than me. All right. Then you're assuming that I might know more than you. All right. Truth, you understand, knows more than anyone. I instruct you to never again permit anyone or anything to make you feel bad. Now, I put it in a generalization just as simply as I can. Never again. Now, what's going to happen during the break? You, if you get your feelings hurt one more time for the rest of your life, just once for the rest of your life, you don't know what you've told me about you. You have told me that you would rather have a life of pain than of freedom. You have told me that you know what is best for you. You know more than reality itself. You understand why I'm putting it that way. I hope it gives you some kind of a little jolt so that you can understand that you don't want to see what is true because you're afraid to. You, you're very much afraid, all of you in this room, you're very much afraid the truth is going to win you over. And do you understand why you're afraid of that? Because then you can't be you anymore. Because then you can't just, just roll along, just go to sleep in the canoe and drift down the stream. You can't go to sleep. If, if truth comes along and tries to wake you up, then you're going to have to make an effort to wake up, aren't you? And you don't want to do that. The word laziness enters very, very prominently. You should become aware of it very prominently in the spiritual life. Laziness means that you don't want to go against what you presently are. You just want to be 100% with it and continue to get your feelings hurt and get a thrill out of that. And look at, look at all the following extra wrong self-identifications you can get just out of getting your feelings hurt. How marvelous. You can sit at home now for the next... 45 minutes and cry, cry over you. And you are performing a stage act. Listen to what I'm going to say and see if you can try to understand it. Anytime you cry over yourself, you are crying over absolutely nothing at all. But you say, I cry. I must therefore be crying over someone. Now, who is that someone? Well, me is all I've got. I must be crying over me. Deluded thoughts from beginning to end. There is no... Please, this is so important. There is no one there for you to cry over, but you go into the act of crying so that you can de deceive yourself into thinking that there's someone worth crying over. Uh, let's see how well I can describe that. That is called neurosis. That is called sickness. That is called lack of true spirituality. That can be called self-centeredness. That can be called a terrible way to live. Why are you so afraid to be happy? Because your best friend is misery, that's why. You're miserable. Well, there, isn't, there isn't a single one of you in this hall that isn't miserable. I'll rephrase that. All of you in this room are miserable. No exceptions at all. Imagine a young man walking down the street with some friends, a dozen friends, a gang, thugs. And you know thugs will turn against each other for five cents, just as much against the people they assault on the street. Anyway, this young man is walking down with a lot of his thug friends. And because they're treacherous, just as your so-called inner friends are treacherous, emotions. And as they're walking down the street, they turn on him and beat him up. And he's battered and bruised. 
And they walked down the street a little further, and they beat him up again. A little further, and they beat him up again. A policeman comes along, and he says, what's going on here? He's speaking to the battered boy. He says, what are you doing sticking with these people who are beating you up every block or so? He says, I have to. They're the only friends I've got. understand you you won't give up your tears you won't give up what's been beating you up they're the only friends you have oh only a daring human being ever makes it out because everybody says that why should I leave my pain, my tears, my misery, when they're the only friends I've got. If I leave them, I will lead a miserable life. If I leave them, I will be unhappy. What do you think you are now? You say, if I... You see, you don't even know what's gone through your mind. Your mind, all, all of you here in this room have been thinking as follows, and you don't know it, because you're completely unaware. You're saying to yourself, if I accept what that man is saying up there, if I accept that, I will lose my friends my misery, my sarcasm, my pretense that I already know, I will lose those. But you don't know you're thinking that. And you will argue and you will fight and you'll say, don't tell me that I already know what is right. You know what you're doing? You're despising the truth and you are going to pay the price, but you love the price. You love despising what is decent. Can you imagine that? Can you believe it? Don't believe it. See it. In the last half hour, I have presented before you your exact condition. I've explained why it's there. I have told you how to begin to leave it, and that's a long process in itself. You have to stick with it. What's your decision? I'm going to tell you what your real decision is. Don't kid me. Don't tell me you're interested in truth just because you read books. There's only one test of your sincerity. And I know this, and you'll, you'll want to lie about it. You won't want this. You won't want what I'm going to tell you to be the truth. Too bad it is. There's only one test as to whether you are a sincere human being or whether you lie about wanting a new life. And that is whether you come to further classes or not, further meetings. We have meetings six, the gentlemen there have meetings six times a week here in Los Angeles where you'll hear more of what you've heard today. Now, I'm aware some of you may live long distances or something like that. For heaven's sakes, if you're starving, you'd go a thousand miles to get food. If you don't come back to more of these classes or read the books, do what you can. Get into this. Get into the truth. Listen to the tape. If you don't do that, I want you to know that you have been deceiving yourself all your life. And if you don't wake up and stop doing that, you're going to continue to go downhill, especially since you've come here today. See, it's too late now. You've come here and a lot of you didn't know what you were getting into. You, you thought you were going to be lied to today, just like you're lied to every place else you go. Isn't this nice to know that finally you can make a, a choice in favor of yourself at last? A choice in favor of your life at last. It's been presented to you. Think long and hard about these things and watch especially how everything that's kept you captive screams against what you've heard here today. And let me highly recommend that all of you do buy that little green booklet. It's just a dollar out there called Freedom from Harmful Voices. It backs up in much detail than everything we've talked about today. Get it, take it home, read it, not just once. Read it a minimum of 50 times and watch how each time you read it some new truth about yourself. Don't talk about God. You don't know who he is. Investigate the trash, the mess that's inside of you. That's what you have to pass through on the road to God. 
And finally, when you get rid of the mess inside of you, you'll know who God is. And you won't have to think about it. You won't say, I know God. It will be quiet and it will be complete. And then, then, never, never again will you ever be afraid of anything, including life or death. Because you'll be above them, just as God himself is above them. When, when you grew up in your home, you, of course, you lived there all those years. You watched your parents in operation, didn't you? You saw how weak they were, how Papa was always mad about something, and how Mama lied about things because she was scared. You, you don't have to live your life like your parents did. They didn't know the truth, and you know they didn't know it, and I know my parents didn't know it. You can be different, and don't go into any false sentimentality over them. You are responsible for your life and your life only. And don't you use it as an excuse or an evasion to go into sentimentality or think you can save the world. Save yourself. Then you'll have something to give to the world which will be the spirit of truth, which is the only thing that can save it. Good afternoon.